Welcome. I have another repeat guest. I have Hector Colonis, and he is the founder of Syncaroo, and he curates This Week in Coworking, which is a newsletter. He a weekly newsletter. He also previously founded Included.co, which is a co-working perks program. We are going to do a catch-up because Hector and I were just chatting, and the last time he was on the podcast was in 2017, early 2017. Hector was episode 38, the early days, and this will be in the 240-ish range. So it's been some time. You've um, your company has evolved. Your personal life has has evolved. Um, I'm super excited because you have one of those unique perspectives, sort of macro and micro perspectives on the industry. So I'm looking forward to catching up. So um, speaking of catching up, catch us up, <laughs> both personally and professionally, since the last time we chatted. Well, firstly, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Um, it's just amazing, 250-something episodes in between the two. Um, been fantastic to see all the great work you've done and your communities have done sort of between that time. Um, from my side, yeah, there's a lot that's changed. Just one, one kind of point to note on the intro, um, I uh, co-founded Syncaroo. So uh, I, I co-founded with Robert Croft, who's my co-founder at the company. Um, but a bit of kind of backstory um, or update on the backstory. Uh, last time we spoke, we had um, we had launched just this company called Included.co. We run the co-working perks programs. I think at the time around 50 to 60 co-working spaces worldwide, we had just started working with some American spaces. Um, and I told you about this in, in the podcast about this dream I had to move to America to, to lead the company from here. Um, well, now I'm in America. Um, the family is growing. We're based here. Um, Included now represents uh, at least 780 co-working spaces worldwide. Um, we power Perks programs embedded in Nexus, embedded in Office R&D. Um, it is now run by Joanna Fall, who is based out in uh, in Germany. She leads the day-to-day the -day operations. Um, and I've spent a lot of my time shifting to what we're building at Syncaroo, um, noticing that how people discover the right space or the right space at the right time for the right job um, just hasn't evolved quick enough for the way the world is working and the, world, the way the world is changing how it works. Um, so been, uh, back in November, I looked at you know, what was the challenges, put out an open call on my blog, um, spoke to a whole lot of really amazing people around the industry, um, and landed up co-founding Syncaroo to tackle what we think is one of the biggest challenges in, in uh, the day-to-day -day running of co-working spaces today and five years from now. So, right. In the meantime, while you're doing all of this innovative work, you have a four and a half month old son named Augie <laughs> who yes. came into the world and shook things up a little bit when you and I were corresponding. I was like, Hector, I don't know how you do all the things that you do. And, you know, <laughs> you're a new dad. So congrats on that. Thank um, you very much. Yeah. And congrats on blessed. staying sane. And so, yeah, tell us about... <laughs> Thinkaroo, you saw a problem um, and you want to solve it. I'm guessing this is not the last problem you'll solve in the industry. <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, what does it solve? How does it work? All the things. And then sure. I'll I'll poke around with some follow-up questions. Perfect. So I think the main the main thing I noticed was co-working spaces spend a lot of the time finding the perfect people to run their communities, people who have the best personal skills. They have some fluency with computers. They um, understand the business and hospitality side. And what they don't hire people to do is copy information from one system to another. Like it's just a very bad use of those people's time who could be you know, improving the, the, the tenant experience, improving the, the, the visitor experience, or just improving the way the space operates. Um, so I initially looked at wh why isn't there a way for all these management systems to update the abundance of online directories that exist for co-working spaces. Um, and one of the things we found is that because there was no independent unified mechanism for all these different systems to talk to each other that wasn't fully owned or influenced by any of the platforms or the management systems. Um, so we set out to build 
what we believe is the middleware solution. So a system that sits between solutions, um, but also a global distribution system for uh, the inventory and the booking flow of our flex spaces. Um, now we came up or we started working on this in 2019. We knew that in the future, the frequency, quantity, and value of transactions would skyrocket for co-working spaces. Um, if you want to drive back to 2019 with me, we were at that time where you know most sales were for short-term one-month passes, a slight increase in day passes, shift now to sort of 2021. We have governments giving access to their entire employee base. We have entire uh, multinational banks giving apps to their uh, employees. We have the uh, you know some of the world's largest commercial brokerages giving remote or drop-in access to their um, to their clients to their clients' clients, um, etc. So what does that mean? It just if the if the community manager had to update all these different systems, we're talking about hundreds of hours a year. If we then have to think about for every transaction, something needs to be copied from one system into a system and then access granted, and then meeting room booked, and all these things that need to happen for every single one of these transactions. What happens when you know the next 5 million people wanna use a co-working space three hours a day, or um, as they move throughout a city, or you know be close to their, their kid's school in the afternoon, but be close to clients in the morning? Um, and the only way for us to facilitate is to automate those pieces. So the most, exhausting and boring pieces of the whole transaction but it was just completely broken so we spent a year behind the scenes connecting a whole bunch of different systems um and we then rolled out in the middle of last year a private beta so we're inviting spaces who are either using nexodus cobot office rnd desk works and hopefully soon a census to jump in and start automating these processes start automating how they're not only updating these platforms um, but also how they're getting their bookings synced back into their centralized management system. So they can know who's coming, where they came from, do some business intelligence on that. And I realize I've been talking for uh, way too long. So uh, any questions on that? <laughs> the, que the questions are building up, Hector. So <laughs> it's good. we'll give you a break and have some water. Um, okay, when you say systems, give us some examples sure. of so, like the, yeah, the, the inbound systems. And um yep yeah, so let's start there cool so i'm trying to think if i should go more high play. no we won't go high play. we'll go for actual examples and then i'll say why we've okay. chosen those as our pilot so okay. we've got um things like google uh, business listings right i know really important to you very very um a very very important for co-working spaces right uh we 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 sync through the the opening hours and some some critical information to Google Business Profile. Now it's fine if you have one space, but if you have a hundred spaces, keeping that stuff up to date, it's a whole job. Um, Especially also, because that platform is expanded, you can put products up. You, you right? There's there's exactly. more inventory. Yeah, it's it's different. It has exactly. evolved, which is great. But you're right, another whole system to keep exactly contained. right. Um, and then you've, we've got Upflex, CloudVO, um, we're waiting for Flow, DeskPass, FlowPass, and I think three more who are busy finishing their integrations. Um, we've also got a broker's portal, a broker system. So instead of sending out, you know, those emails that you have to keep sending out to the big brokers or the independent brokers in your area who keep um, saying, we have 30 person desk, send us your availability right now or you lose this client. Um, we've basically designed a, a mechanism where you can give independent operate, independent brokers um, a snapshot of your availability now and for the next three months so that they don't have to email back and forth to say, hey, we have a client. Instead, they're like, we see you have availability for a 10-person office. We'd like to book it for our client. Can we come and do a viewing? Um, that saved what, maybe five emails per request? adds up to hundreds of emails. And also prevents you from being taken off the list. One of the biggest complaints I often hear is, I felt like I responded right away and they'd like moved on already. Exactly, <laughs> so, right? Yeah. Um, so our, our idea is to give brokers more more tools. We're seeing it now from, from all the other brokers. They're also noticing this. Um, we're seeing, you know, everyone from Avison Young to JLL Collier, they're all investing in their own tech stacks for getting in this inventory. Um, so integrating with them. 
But there's also independent, there's boutique brokers who really get co-working, really get the differences and the nuances between spaces who are increasingly getting more and more traffic, um, but they haven't got the budgets to build entire tech stacks. So we're giving them tools to be able to work with, you know, however many spaces they want to work with um, and get the data they need to close sales faster. Obviously that's, that's the end goal. Um, other than that, we've got a bro, we've got a, uh, uh, what we call website widgets. So you can create as many little um, snapshots of your inventory. You can give that to your local coffee shop, your local chamber of commerce, whoever you've built kind of partnerships with, they put it inside their own websites and they all stay automatically updated. So every time you build a partnership, you have another live feed of your inventory to their customer base. Um, and that's, that's proven very, very popular. Uh, we, we built it as kind of something that one customer needed. And more and more spaces are like, well, why wouldn't I, instead of just giving them five pictures and our current pricing, yeah. give them this little widget that they can put on their website and it will always show what's available, what the pricing is. And you don't have to worry about outdated things um, being all over the internet. Um, so that's, that's just a, just a snapshot of kind of what, um, what we're thinking today. We've got another 60 platforms in development or in our roadmap. Well, I was going to say, there are so many. I think you were involved in the Flex Office um, event in the fall that yes. Office R&D did. And I, in my talk, I had a slide of like all the lead sources. Oh, yeah. And it's like, it feels like it's never ending. There, you know, there, there's so many folks who kind of want to play in that arena. Oh, yeah. And it's hard to know. I get asked all the time, which one should I be on, right? And so I, and you're probably a better person to mm -hmm. ask that question to, but it used to, be, so without Syncaroo, right, the answer would be, okay, if, right, if you only have the capacity to do five of them, yes. <laughs> which was a real challenge to your point, right? You can yep. only commit, you have to sort of 80, 20 this, and so then you don't really know if you're missing leads from other lead sources, yep. but you can only do so much. So if you're going to yes. pick five, pick these. So yep. the ultimate vision of Syncaroo is you don't have to pick, just enter it here and it'll yep. sync to any, do the, yep. does the operator have to opt in to the lead sources? They have yes. to sort of make that. Okay. Yeah. So once you've sort of so, created an account, yeah, you just have to go through that one time and then it all Correct. syncs. Yeah. Correct. Um, so the, the whole idea is we don't like spaces a leaving money on the table yeah um, we don't like people who might be perfect for a co-working space not knowing that it exists yep. or a landlord or whatever it is um we also just don't like the idea of having to pick winners when you don't know what they're all working on um there is this big notion right 100 percent, right i feel that way too i'm like i don't know there's so many new ones and they exactly maybe they're getting this great lead flow i you know it's and it sort of takes a while for that to flow through and exactly. and also it's market dependent i tell people that too i'm like yeah. okay well if i <laughs> if i had a pick i would look at these but you also kind of have to test because it's market yeah. dependent yeah and that testing takes time away from other things. So even though you're not, you know, you're not losing leads, you're losing opportunities from walk-ins or um, upselling to members and referrals. Or you're just your things. own organic, right, or paid marketing. But I love that you do the Google business profile because that's not just other lead sources, that's your yeah. own marketing. Yeah. Yeah. So we have this, this notion um, that we, we speak to a lot of the operators who join our, our beta about. Um, it's a framework that we move away from this idea of a tech stack and what technology they should be using in their space to this idea of thinking of a co-working space or any, any shared workspace um, from the idea of an operational stack. What are the businesses, products, services, and teams that you need to um, build into your, your, your stack so that you bring people from the marketing world, the marketing channels through to your lead generation, into your sales, and then hold them in your hospitality core so this is this is onion idea of you have these different layers on the furthest out is your marketing it's normally outbound it's normally things like google business widgets things like that things that just promote what's available um, and then you get your your lead generation your aggregators um your booking platforms your uh pr that is more engaged with generating leads and then you've got your sales your brokerages your uh, CRMs, those kind of stuff. Um, and then in the middle, you've got hospitality. Anything that your customer touches, um, that's where you've got to focus on, is how quickly you can get the most customers into that core um, to drive up your revenues. 
Um, and that is how we, we normally recommend that spaces think about the shift in, don't just pick solutions that do everything all right. Look at those stacks and pick the things that you can add that give you two X you know, returns, or at least one, even if it's not, as long as it's not um, creating a deficit, um, you should be listed there. You should, because as you said, you don't know what they're doing, right? Um, we're seeing, you know, London right now is probably the hot spot for aggregate, aggregated competition right now. Um, we're seeing entire tubes, um, uh, the, the subway, the underground, being taken over by guerrilla campaigns for some of the apps. We're seeing, oh, interesting. you know, town criers being brought into the city, into, <laughs> into areas and screaming <laughs> about apps. Um, we're seeing acquisitions. We're seeing, you know, there's so much, so many different apps, and we don't know who they're what they're each targeting. Obviously, there's a lot more that has to be done. Yeah, I think from the the aggregator sides to be more transparent about who they're serving, um, and hopefully we can help them with that over the next uh, few months. But the idea is, if your space is I is catering to corporate uh, bookings, drop in bookings, things like that. There are some players in that field, but that doesn't mean that the others won't shift into that. And then if they do shift into that and you're not on their platform, then you've had that you have that gap again, right? Um, so our goal, yeah, as you said, is to allow people to list everywhere and know that everything stays up to date. Um, but we do put the control in the operator's hands. So they have full control from the from their Syncaroo um, system which resources are shared with which which brokers, which platforms, which aggregators, which widgets. So it's not that they have to give all their information to every platform. Okay. We're seeing a lot of kind of merge acquisitions happening now on the aggregator side, which means down the line, we might see you know a competitor investing or owning one of the platforms. So you have to kind of choose how much information you give to them to still get the leads, but not enough that you kind of spill spill your guts or spill your black book um so we've always focused on operator data protection first and then looked at how we can use those settings and those controls to give to, to drive up revenues and reach um, instead of just saying well, you have to give all your information otherwise you can't get leads so an example just being i don't have to list all my offices or i don't have yeah. to Right. I don't have to put all my inventory out. I Correct. can sort of pick and choose. Or some people say, I don't want to list my offices. I can sell my offices myself. I don't <laughs> want to pay the 10% or, you know, whatever Correct. fee. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I just wanted to jump in really quickly before we continue with our discussion. If you're working on opening a co working space, I want to invite you to join me for my free masterclass three behind the scenes secrets to opening a co working space. If you're working on opening a co-working space, I want to share the three decisions that I've seen successful operators make when they're creating their co-working business. The masterclass is totally free. It's about an hour and includes some Q&A. If you'd like to join me, you can register at everythingcoworking.com forward slash masterclass. If you already have a co-working space, I want to make sure you know about Community Manager University. Community Manager University is a training and development platform for community managers, and it can be for owner operators. It has content training, resources, templates from day one to general manager. The platform includes many courses that cover the major buckets of the community manager role from community management, operations, sales and marketing, finance, and leadership. The content is laid out in a graduated learning path. So the community manager can identify what content is most relevant to them, depending on their experience, and kind of jump in from there. We provide a live brand new training every single month for the community manager group. We also host a live Q&A call every single month so that the community managers can work through any challenges that they're having or opportunities, um, get ideas from other community managers, build their own peer network. We also have a private Slack group for the group. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go to everythingcoworking.com forward slash community manager. I also want to highlight a point that you made all of the end users that didn't used to be in the coworking ecosystem. And the fact that this is a struggle for operators and you know, I used to sort of be in the camp of everybody needs a full-time membership. That's how the model works. <laughs> now, 
And now we see, I have a good friend, for example, who works for Zendesk. And she said, oh, we all got $300 a month stipends for co-working. And I'm like, that's awesome, except that's not an office, right? That's like, in, depending on the market, it is not even a dedicated desk. Mm. So yep. like how, what's the, how are they going to use that? You know, yep. does she want five days in an office? Does she want to, you know, a half a day in a meeting room? Like yep. how is she going to spend that? And I think what you're saying is right. And where is she going to spend it? Is she going direct to you or has the employer said you got to go through X platform? Yeah. Right. And so on the operator end, being able to handle the that like demand of like these bite size or you know whatever that looks like yeah. because we didn't want to use to have the uh, you know sort of high maintenance <laughs> part super part you know part time but there's that market is so will be big i think we haven't yeah. quite i'm guessing yeah. you have more insight you know into those transactions that are happening than I do, I get the sense like we're still at the very beginning of that, oh, yeah. like actually, because even you said, you know, COVID spikes and some people are, it's just like, we're not quite there yet. And it's a really new um, uh, behavior for yeah. that user to learn, but it's like the potential is so high right now for that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you hit a, a really important point on the head there that operators need to really understand the people who are choosing where and how and when to work have never had to pick before. They don't know anything about us, the aggregators, what was popular in 2019. Right. They know nothing, right? Um, so they're turning to their friends on Instagram. They're turning to folks on TikTok. They're looking at, you know, where they get invited to for meetings or events or what, and they're picking. So I think it's really, really important for people to realize that the decision makers have changed. It's either team leaders or independents or individuals and- Or all of the or, above, right? Or, Which, yeah, it could, it, yeah. exactly. But I mean, you're also getting this idea where a lot of operators are like, okay, go use a $300 stipend. It's, it's easier for us to do because we just assign it to you. It's going to be a fuss at the next tax time. Not this one, but the next one, people have to define whether that's income or not. Um, even though it's a stipend. Um, so we're going to see a lot more organizations shift to kind of centralizing billing. You can use the co-working space as much as you want, use the credit, whatever, but we need the accounts All in one place. to show us, you know, what people are using. Um, but also that with those accounts to show us data, right? If I'm, if I'm an employer and I have 10,000 employees around the world, I want to see where people are congregating if they were given unlimited choice. If we see that, I, we had an office in Manhattan. We don't need an office in Manhattan because everyone's congregating in Brooklyn or congregating in Jersey City. Why not get a team membership in Jersey City and lower that monthly cost, right? So you get, you get to make really, really interesting shifts to your workspace strategy, um, being more kind of responsive as opposed, as opposed to predictive. Whereas before we had this idea where you had to go and get a co-working membership for 30 people and then hope that everyone can commute in there. I mean, when I got into co-working, on, on the kind of Airbnb for co-working side, I was very, very prominent in London. And we all, the number one question is, what, what, what tube stations is it close to? What's the, what's the transportation? We need to make sure our employees can get yeah. in from zone four. Um, whereas now, if you can give people sort of unlimited reign to go pick where they want to work and then open offices where you see them already congregating, it changes the whole uh, acquisition strategy, right? Um, and basically the world of work, as the world of work changes the way we as operators we as a, as a uh, as a as a ecosystem of uh, of businesses have to change how we interact um it's not just that it's an it's an unnecessary overhead to have a day member that day member might be a c level executive they might then bring in 30 people next week and then you know open an office there and take an entire floor you never know who's using these day passes etc um, so yeah, it's, it's just going to change everything and you have to be listed everywhere. You have to make sure you have fluid experiences. Everyone has a uniform kind of first citizen experience. Cause I think that's what happens a lot of times. I mean, we saw it with Phil, um, when he booked the space in, in New York, he needed to get in, the alarm went off. Like it, a full-time member would never have had that problem, right? There would have been some, some system in place, but because it came through an app, the person didn't see it, whatever, there was a delay. 
we can't risk that because if he was a C-level executive or it was, you know, at some point, that space is essentially blacklisted for something that was outside of their control. And so these things are happening day in, day out. And we just have to be better at automating the systems um, so that we can capture the opportunity as opposed to letting it become a liability or a risk. So walk me through sort of the full workflow. Is it that if someone, if a lead comes in and books through Syncaroo, like where does that experience end? And yeah, sure. do they get funneled so, into? So today, um, no one can book on Syncaroo, right? That's a very important distinction to make. Yeah. We are not competing with any of the aggregators, yeah. booking platforms, or brokers. Yeah, um, sorry. I but anyone, no problem. Said it that way. Yeah, good clarification. <laughs> I, I just have to say, because a lot, a lot of folks ask us, like, oh, why, why don't you just do the bookings? Because that's not our business. We're a tech company. We're only focused on date, date synchronization. So let's say hub, someone... Like the spokes yeah. are all the... Yes, you sit. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So a booking comes through a integrated system. Let's say one of the booking platforms... Um, before the booking is confirmed, we do a whole bunch of checks. We make sure that it's within operating hours. There is a community manager on, on site based on the data we have. Um, there's no internal bookings. There's no external bookings from any other app for that time. Okay. All these green lights go through, okay, approve the booking. That happens in, in a couple of maybe hundred milliseconds. So really, really instantaneous for the end experience, but protecting the operator from the most annoying parts about handling a booking request. That booking, is confirmed, it then gets piped back into their Nexodus, Office R&D, whatever it is, management system, the same way as an internal member, it will say that it came through via Syncaroo, via X app. Um, and it doesn't go into a calendar, doesn't go into something, it goes right into the management system so that the person who walks in at the front door, the person who welcomes the guests, knows exactly where to find the information. Um, and that's pretty much where we, we're, we're ended right now. We have plans for making that a richer, more um, seamless experience for other pieces. But right now we just wanna make sure that those inbound, that inbound demand, those bookings, those entire new ways of using workspaces um, can be serviced without extra overheads. And tell me if I'm wrong, The another aspect of the value of that workflow is that if that booking goes into Office R&D and I have a bunch of you know, things that are triggered in office R&D, that all happens all in office yeah. R&D. I don't have Correct. to figure out like, oh, I have to manually do it because they came from this place. Exactly. Yeah. So what we, what we realized when we started looking into this is most people's center of truth or their operations runs through their management system. That's where they keep everything yeah. up to date because that's where, if we're honest, that's where- Yeah, I love this, the center of truth. is such a great yeah. way to, to put it, yeah. <laughs> Because that everything else is connected to that. Your automations, mm -hmm. your invoicing, everything else is normally connected to that. The big piece that's missing is all these different people who want to help fill your space. And they just weren't able to connect into that send into, into that 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 hub, into your hospitality core. Um, we want to enable that and then you know help you expand out from that. So it's as you said, it's the things you would have normally done automated for a member can still be done. They'll just be done now for people using the interconnected apps. Yep. I know. I, it's, I love it. It makes complete sense. I feel like there's something else I wanted to point out there. Bookings. Uh, yeah. Um, it'll come back to me in a second. <laughs> so the... Yeah, I lost my my thought on that. Um, <laughs> no problem. So what do you see kind of bigger picture? Um, aggregator movement, lead, what do you, how do you refer to them? Aggregators, lead gen companies, brokers, uh, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, sometimes, so I feel like it's good to, to talk about the terminology because yeah. I'll get new folks sometimes who are like, what? You know? Yeah. So yeah, exa exactly. So I mean, we 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 always lean back on the operational stack. So they're either marketing, lead generation, or sales platforms. Yeah. And sometimes they blur between them, but that's how you can clearly distinguish whether it's purely outbound marketing, whether it's something that generates your lead, or yeah. it's something that actually charges the customer, and then you have to invoice afterwards. So that's how we differentiate okay. between okay. the three things. Yep. Um, I forgot what the question was after that. Um, 
Oh yeah, just the terminology of yeah, oh. brokers, lead gen, yeah. Just so oh, yeah, then you're get asking it. sort of what what do I see? What oh, do we yeah. see the big shifts, right? Where where yeah. not not where the the puck is now, but where the puck is going, right? And I th I think the way that the next five to ten million people interact with co-working space on a daily basis, the mechanisms that will enable that haven't been built yet. Um, I truly believe that we're going to see desk bookings from their watches. We're going to see desk bookings from their Google calendars or their any calendar. We're going to see, you know, it's going to become as seamless as ordering an, an Uber through Google Maps. It's going to be as seamless as, uh, you know, ordering a delivery from a restaurant through their website, but delivered by a, a third party. There's going to be so many ways that the future employee, the future workforce will interact with physical space that I just don't think have been built purely because there wasn't a data infrastructure to connect the physical world with the digital world. We're seeing a lot of shifts now. We're seeing a lot of momentum moving towards corporate bookings, team accounts, centralized billing. It is a huge opportunity. But we're also seeing, you know, platforms launched purely for the creator economy, platforms launched purely for, um, you know, specific, really, really niche communities. And that, that's, it sounds weird, but, you know, if you get the best YouTubers all using one app, all needing the same set of criteria, all booking through one app, that becomes a whole new marketplace, a whole new way for people to engage with, with, with uh, physical space. And then you get e-commerce. All these people need someone to take photos. They need someone to do um, reviews. They need someone to do meetings. Why why isn't there a desk booking mechanism behind Etsy, right? Or a pop-up system where they can show, there's so many ways that the world will interact with physical flex space. And I think we're at that tip now. We're gonna start seeing so much more innovation. We're gonna see so much more um, newcomers come into the sector who will carve entire niches. Um, mm -hmm. You know, before Airbnb, if renting out your house didn't make any, any sense to someone who is a complete stranger, right? Um, and I think we're at that verge now. We have, the, we have the, the inventory, we have the operational experience, we have a lot of experienced platforms out there. Um, and now we have newcomers, we have people who are booking space for the first time. A lot of people who launched um, some of the most popular aggregators right now felt the frustration of trying to book space when they first entered the market. So what's going to happen is the, the, the newer generations of workers who have entirely new ways of thinking of interacting with the space are probably going to find the same frustrations. They're going to find, well, I think we can do it better. Why don't we build an app that lets people book by the minute, by the hour, whatever it is. And th that's where I think it's going. I think we're, we're going to see a lot more consolidation. We're going to see a lot of the, a lot of aggregators who are from, let's say, version three of co-working consolidating and then we're going to see this new version this new breed of of, of integrations deep integrations into you know co co corporate commercial booking platforms and it's, it's going to be it's, it's going to be fascinating 2022 is going to be probably the year where we see really interesting things happening on the booking element of, of our co-working spaces so i'm curious what your sort of intuitive intuitive side says about human behavior around leaving the house so mm -hmm. i was i was talking to um one of the aggregators and he made this point that gave me some pause you know he said that co-working used to kind of compete with the office it was like the, the cooler better office mm -hmm. he's like and now it kind of is the office right it's yeah. because because the reference point is home <laughs> yeah for, that, for everyone true, right? and and he yeah. was just kind of you know will people go you know will they mm -hmm. will they leave the house will they do that and i think one of the things that's happening is so i i went to this san francisco work tech conference and you know all these work tech is just is very like um corporate real estate folks and hr and all the people who are making policy around where people work and I mean, my takeaway was like, wow, people are really anchoring on working at home. <laughs> and, and I think partly that's because they don't feel like they can advocate for the middle ground, right? It's it's like, 
you know, home is as far as I can sort of push right now, but I'd rather be at home than at work. So yeah, yeah, I just am curious, like we get really excited about all the potential demand. What's your sense as to? I mean, I think we have to, there's essentially two things that that are happening, right? In 2020, 2021, a lot of the narrative was work from home or work from the office. There was no mention of this work near home, um, third places, you know, working from a co-working space two days a week in the, the HQ. Although in our circles, the hybrid idea or the hub and spoke thing right. was talked about endlessly. Right, no really <laughs> exactly. The time. We all talk about so, it endlessly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no one really explained that to the, once again, going back to the decision makers. Like if they don't know that they can choose that because every wing's telling them home or office, if I have to worry about childcare or whatever it is, I'm going to choose home because that makes the most economic sense. And I hate commuting. Everyone hates commuting. Right. Like it's such a dead time. I mean, I, I like going for a walk now in the morning instead of commuting, but having to do the commute outside of my preference is absolutely infuriating to many people. We're seeing it all, all over the world. Um, and I think that's the one, fixing that narrative has to happen, right? People have to understand that they have this flexibility. Um, and the second is, it comes down to the employers. It comes down to them making it easy that someone doesn't have to ask permission. They don't have to um, go through an application process. They, they can be given access to space um, and use it as and when they want. Because what happens then is we're, we're seeing a lot of case studies now, companies like Spotify, where in their internal, Spotify and Slack, I think were the two leading examples, um, they would invite other coworkers to come to the office so they can hang out and work on projects. And when I say the office, I'm saying the co-working space that's nearest to them or coordinating a centralized point that they can all commute to um, for specific projects or on specific days or maybe on a Friday and they all go for a drink afterwards. Um, so the social sort so of idea is still there. It just has to be looked at from a different type. Like the, the idea of corporate culture is completely changing for those companies. Um, celebrating those those gatherers those people who bring together your your employees to a central place and giving them the tools to make it really easy for someone to decide i mean if i have to pick between sitting on my desk or go find a space do a viewing make a request ask my my boss if i can use that oh it's 50 dollars more okay calculate whether i want to spend 600 dollars a year a year too much friction the- right yeah and the less decisions they have to make, the better. Um, and that, that's, that's where it's gonna get to. I think we're gonna, we're gonna see that really opening people's eyes because for a long time, a lot of people wanted to work from home and then they did. Um, and pre-pandemic days, and they realized how they wanted co-working. That's why co-working exploded. That was where we all go into this from. Um, and we're, as we shift away from that, that that duality, either work from home or work from the office, yeah. um, people will start experimenting. They'll start, as I said, um, rebuilding their days based on the outside of work stuff. Where is soccer practice today? Where is um, that client meeting? Um, where do I where do I want to meet my friends for dinner afterwards? And then picking locations based on those things. As a because I mean, a laptop can plug in anywhere as long as the infrastructure is built and provides the same experience regardless of where you are you have that freedom and i think that's where we're going to get to is freeing the knowledge workers to pick how to structure their day now i wish it could be possible for all workers everywhere but um right now it is you know we're talking about desk-based work and i think that if that freedom is given we're going to see that 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 demand start to surge but it, it's a messaging thing right now it's just about explaining that you you can work not in the office, but not from home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Somebody needs to uh, run that campaign for us. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose all of the aggregators, you know, all the platforms that you're bringing together will, they're incented to help do that for the industry. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what their job is, right? Their job is to generate those leads and generate that, 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 that idea of, of remote, flexible freedom to, to work where you want to work. Um, and not this idea of you're going to sit on the beach sipping Mai Tais instead of doing your work, right? Yeah. There's this really weird remote 
digital nomad idea that was propagated in the last 10 years. Um, and it's up to the aggregators and the booking platforms and the brokers and even the employers to promote the true image. And it's not what we had in 2020. It's not what we had early 2021. Um, it's not this being forced to work from your one bedroom in Manhattan, right? Um, and that, that's going to take time because if you speak to the employers, they're still trying to figure out what it all means. Um, and the more we can mix employers and co-working, the better that narrative will become. The more they can experience it themselves, the better the narrative will become. And that, that's how we all win. Love it. Hector, thank you for taking the time to do this. We need to not have... Um... 200 episodes go by before we do this again. And I think there will be probably some um, exponential shifts in the marketplace in the next year or so. So Definitely. I hope we can um, do this again. So I have a bunch of links for you in the show notes. Um, your personal site, Sinkaroo, um, This Week in Coworking, your awesome newsletter that highlights like all the do not miss things that happened in the industry every week. So if you want to connect with Hector, find the newsletter, you can do that in the show notes. Hector, anything I missed before we wrap up? Nope, that, that's everything. Awesome. Thank you very much again for having me. And yes, that's, that's uh, aim for a hundred next time at the <laughs> max, right? Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to put you in the calendar. Thanks, Hector. Thank you very much.